each year the creative writing program gives um, a special limited number of students the opportunity to write a creative thesis for consideration for honors in the English major. We also have a couple of minors complete the thesis because that's how incredible our minors are. They're perfectly qualified to, to complete an, an, you know, an ambitious work, creative work in creative writing. The goal is for students to envision and complete a substantial project that serves as the capstone of their creative writing careers at Penn, careers that are storied and various and incredibly ambitious. The main body of the thesis consists of an extensive piece of writing that could be a novel or a novel excerpt, collection of stories, poems, or essays, a script for the stage, screen, or radio, a piece of long form nonfiction or journalism, and also hybrid and cross genre projects that don't fit neatly in any of the boxes I just mentioned. Students also preface the thesis with a substantial critical commentary, but this is not a conventional essay. This is an opportunity for students to situate their work in the broader context of intellectual and creative life that they themselves you know, are entering with this capstone project. And finally, this is an exercise that reiterates our program's commitment to the value that good readers make good writers. We believe in training students to think of themselves as really entering entering the discourse. So tonight we're gonna to hear excerpts from 10 different creative projects. We're gonna have an amazing reception afterwards in the dining room. We have, um, the Writer's House has very, very kindly reminded me that they have graduation cords up here. Any graduating senior, no matter what your relationship to the creative writing program, um, is welcome to grab one for graduation day, so please do that. We are not going remotely in alphabetical order, sorry. We're going in an order that was devised based on the fact that people have lots of end of term commitments, including a couple of classes to get to. So I'm gonna announce like the next upcoming few readers and then I'll just continue to announce and sorry for the for the short for the lack of notice for those um, who don't know yet when they're going on but it's okay it's all gonna be great we're gonna hear from all of you and you're all gonna be fantastic and most folks will be introduced by their thesis advisors which is also my favorite part of this reading so first I am going to invite Ashna Yakub and, and uh, Ashna is gonna be followed by Abigail Walker so first I'd like to welcome J.J. Johnson to introduce Ashna. Thanks, Julia. Hello, everyone. Neoliberalism is the economic model of privatization and free market capitalism. As ideology, it says that any social or cultural problem we have has a market solution. In fleeting moments of discontent, Ashna Yakub turns her critical attention toward the demographic pressure the neoliberal subject feels in terms of an ongoing process she calls normalization. How do we reconcile normalization and critique of an all-absorbing neoliberal apparatus? How do we avoid merely trying to find or produce that which the system can't consume? If neoliberalism has not only enabled a refoundation of its project during each crisis, but has especially made possible its reinforcement in terms of both accumulation and symbolism, as Martinez Jimenez points out, and if, as Ashna posits, despite social and economic dissatisfaction with neoliberalism, it continues to infiltrate itself, especially within popular culture, how does symbolic neoliberal accumulation circulate as capital, as value, and values? How do we examine the effects and affect of a symbolic order that is utterly pervasive and infinitely absorptive? Well, suggests Ashna, we can look at how we tell stories, how we present ourselves, which she does in writing as performance of self. Networked, interactive syllabus, some links work, some links don't, uncanny spec film script, viewing notes that notice the reflections in every screen, critical commentary interrupted by pop-up ads and reader comments, all of this is hybrid, self-conscious performance writing, the mess of self, and a way through. If we insist on our agency, we assert ourselves as critical observers rather than consumers. We can be subjects without being objectified. 
we can create art from our experience without becoming products. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, this is a living document. So I'm unsure if this will translate well reading it because you're supposed to interact with it, but I will do my best. Um, so I'll read a little bit of the introduction and some excerpts. Um, this is a living document of curated moments meant to paint a picture of neoliberalism as it currently functions in the media as a permeation of itself. What is habit or an everyday occurrence becomes meaningful in its redundancy. Moments we don't think much of, seconds that are repressed due to mundane nature, I seek to bring meaning to these moments and to reassess them as part of a larger cultural phenomenon. The notion that every second is meaningful is a further permeation of the neoliberal idea that every moment is an indiv individual moment that seeks to be re-examined, has value. Yet this document is also full of those hypocrisies. The very idea that this is a creative writing honors thesis, written for an institution that profits off the financial investments of its students, Promising the possibility of mobility in exchange for thousands of dollars is relevant to my thesis, which participates in the economy. And what do I stand to gain? There is an ulterior motive to this document and that I do stand to profit from it. Maybe not financially, although you can Venmo me at ashna Yakub if you'd like. Um, but this is my form of capital, especially as a creative, whatever that means. Um, the larger purpose, if you can forgive the personal stakes of this document, is to take these disparate scenes and create meaning from how they interact with the larger economic structure we adhere to in this specific hypercapitalist moment. Take it as you like. So the first one I'll be reading is the perpetual ad. Today, I watched the same 20-second advertisement on HBO four times. Since when did HBO Max air advertisements? This is new. It is interesting to note that while HBO was glitching, I was trying to watch an episode of The Sopranos for performative consumption. It could not remember where I'd left off, but it could remember to repeat the ad. As I write this, I'm unsure what the ad was for. It was fleeting, perhaps a car ad. Family, friendship, Subaru. I sometimes become anxious about being a car owner. All I want to do is to watch an episode of The Sopranos. I want to see what the hype's all about. I want to be able to say, wow, I love The Sopranos. You should watch it. I'm scrolling on my phone instead. I wish I could get through a movie without looking at my phone. Sometimes I look at Wikipedia as I'm watching the movie because I get anxious about what's gonna happen next. Technology doesn't work as well as, as it once did, but things were so different 10 years ago. I search up different terms and I receive the same results. Who is the actor on SNL who died a while back? Google has no idea what I'm talking about. Am I not being clear enough? I get a notification from work. Can you get started on this? I would if I could, but I'm busy trying to watch an episode that won't start. Has my episode still not started? Let me start my restart my television. Here's another ad. I'll just watch something else instead. I didn't want to watch The Sopranos anyway. This next one is called Crypto. Two friends of mine are writing a TV pilot titled Shitcorn. I ask them what it's about. This is after I tell them, wow, that's really cool. I hope to be doing something like that one day. Actually, do you know if there's someone I could talk to about breaking into the industry? They say, it's like Broad City meets crypto. I see them again one day and I ask them again how the pilot's coming along, this time without all the dick eating. I'm growing as a person at this point and I'm coming to terms with embracing idleness post-grad. They say, good, it's like if Legally Blonde met crypto bros. Two girls get drunk and try to figure out how it works. I ask them, because I must, do you guys know what crypto is? They shake their heads, no. We don't completely understand it, no. I ask them what their thoughts are on the bank closures, specifically the ones that dealt exclusively in crypto. What do these failures mean for the pilot, now picked up by the producer of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, because that's Hollywood, baby. They shook their heads again. They didn't have an opinion. They're interacting with a version of crypto from a year ago, back when it was profitable for the sake of narrative. I asked them, simply because I need to know, I had to know, is crypto still relevant? Is this pilot relevant? Or is the suspension of disbelief mired so far in the past that it's impossible to even imagine? Can I imagine getting drunk and investing in crypto right now? I don't think I can, but perhaps the story isn't for me. And that's okay. 
Maybe this can be another critically acclaimed, criminally underwatched media that coastal elites will rave about, that middle America will never watch because they're too busy watching Yellowstone, only to get ultimately canceled by whatever streaming platform it debuts on. And isn't that the dream? This last one is called real work. Let's redefine work for a second. What is real work? Are we thinking about it in terms of the industrial revolution? You kids don't know what real work is. We used to go to the factories every morning at sunrise and work until it's well after sundown, all to put food on the table. You're right, I don't know what real work is. Real implies that there's a certain essence of work, that the work we are working is work, truly work, authentic work, the most work one could get. In the post-industrial world we live in, a world full of nonprofit work, financial investment jobs, what does real work mean in this regard, and what does fake work entail? Nothing can be a value without being an object of utility. If the thing is useless, so is the labor contained in it. The labor does not count as labor, and therefore creates no value. Marx. Now consider the plight of the creative. The creative, forever cursed to engage in so-called creative work, defines itself by other modes of labor, insinuating that creativity is a form of labor to be repackaged into productivity. The neoliberalization of creativity and art reframes itself within profitable terms. At the same time, it is utterly disregarded as an appropriate form of work. You're an English major? Any two-year-old can do that. Why would you waste your time? What are you going to do with an English major? How is that going to help you? Are you pre-law? At the same time, I want to be able to profit off my own creative skill, curating an individual personality that people deem worthy of listening and subscribing to. Is that not neoliberal of me, to think that I have something worth saying, more so than the general masses, that I should write and perform for consumption, create a persona that the masses will simultaneously like and recognize? The labor that goes into such curation feels not real. It feels like fake work, not authentic. It pales in comparison to those working in the factories, running a small business, waiting tables. Ironically, if you tell a student you're going to wait tables for the summer, they may look down on you. Such is the case with any blue-collar job, I find it hard to stand my ground sometimes, saying that I hope to just wait it out for a while while working on my own material as a writer. There is a romanticized notion of real work, while white-collar jobs are valorized in that they're, able, they're capable of a big paycheck. And to do what exactly? No one's sure. There are a lot of words involved in regards to time and space, optimization, efficiency, innovation, technology. They are also just words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asha. Thank you for going first. Um, and thank you for sticking around until it's time for you to go to your class, because you have class tonight, because that's very hardcore. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Abigail Walker. And after Abigail, we're going to hear from Sophie Nadal. If that sounds good to you, Sophie. Sophie, are you? OK, awesome. Thank you very much. OK, so this comes at the end of my project. And I have done some strange things with it, so I hope I don't mess it up. Um, OK. My grandmother had arranged the meeting on behalf of my grandfather and turned the screen to face him. She sat out of sight, which was unusual. It would have been typical for me to ask about the weather, see if Brattleboro, Vermont, got any snow that week. But my grandfather, Papa, blocked the back porch from my view. It was my mother's house, too. She lived there when she was small, and I've slept in her childhood room many times, eyes always pinned on the imitation Monet painting above the bed. It was there in those moments that I grew to understand the pieces that made me. Well, my dad started me off with a single shot 22, which I still have, Papa said. I raised my eyebrows, though looking back, it makes sense he'd still have it. My grandfather was hunting woodchucks when he was 12 with that first single shot 22, soon followed by pheasants, then deer. I used to take my shotgun, wrap it in a blanket, and ride my bicycle to what we called the flats. That's where the pheasant hunting was in Rochester. That is how gun laws have changed. You're not allowed to do that anymore? I don't think I'd want to try it, honey, Papa answered. The majority of my grandfather's early memories involve wooded areas, wooded areas, his father, and Charlie House. To this day, I am unsure exactly who Charlie House was. It seems as though my entire family has met this man, played cards with him, and walked around his farm near Seneca Lake, New York. 
Somehow he has been the subject of many stories that I've absorbed since infancy. When a person slams a winning card on the table, it's always Charlie House. I think he may have been a friend of my great-grandfather who was allegedly shot down through his arm one time near a pump house. The bullet was removed and my mother had yet to hear the story until I related to her later that evening. He never had a bird dog, but Charlie House had an English setter named Tick. We went pheasant hunting one morning. Charlie had to milk early and so he was ready like maybe by 9, 30, 10 o'clock. He had a shotgun, I had mine. We opened up the back bar of the barn door and walked out. There was this, this bush about, oh, maybe 30 yards out. Tick was in front of us and all of a sudden Tick went to a point. Papa stopped for a moment. You've seen a pointer point, he asked. Yes, I said, miming the dog's gesture with my arm, curling down my hand. His tail was wagging and Charlie says, well, you're a damn fool. There's not gonna be a pheasant in that little bush. One step and guess what? There was one, so we basically emptied all of our guns and the pheasant was never hit. The dog, I think, actually stared us down. He said, I told you where that pheasant was. Yeah, yeah. Mimi asked my grandfather to bring up a story set on Bristol Mountain, a small ski area in Canandaigua Lake, New York. This can tell you what a lot of hunters in a small area can do, and it can get scary at times, Papa said. My dad got an invite for himself and me because he was on the ski patrol with Bristol Mountain. We went down there very early in the morning and we rode the chairlift up and they stopped it up and hit different towers. You could see all of the cars coming up from the metropolitan area of Rochester. It was so clear that you could hear the people loading their rifles, not rifles, shotguns. And 10 minutes later, the deer that were all at the bottom of this mountain started coming up the mountain. And guess what? They were all shooting, shooting up towards you. My mother knew this story and she would later describe the scene of my grandfather and great grandfather's early return home, roughed up, wide eyed. Some guy who was a little bit crazy, he shot one of the deer out of the chair, Papa said. My mother said someone died. Following the conversation with Mimi and Papa, Mimi sent me a picture of my uncle with his first deer. It hangs from a tree. My uncle stands beside the animal's body. In my first conversation with Uncle David, he told me about that experience. I can tell you, my uncle began, as a kid, it was very rare to see somebody shooting deer. I never saw one until I shot one myself. There was a brief quiet. But there were deer around. I knew this. Yes, we would see deer, but just nothing with antlers, and if we did see something with antlers, there wasn't always an opportunity to get a shot at it. I recall seeing the heads of antlered creatures in my grandfather's basement. There were never any animals paraded on the walls. Maybe if my mother's side of the family liked to kill moose, I would have been able to look something dead in the eyes. I could have been more than a child with Triscuits and Vermont cheddar in her mouth, a child with some strange connection to a living room carcass. Rather, deer heads stayed in the cluttered room ahead of the place where the laundry machines were, adjacent to the room that housed about 100 containers of maple syrup. That whole area was an archive of sorts. There was maple syrup from the last time my family sugared with my great-grandfather, Gramp. My Mimi would show me that. My uncle was 12 years old when he shot his first deer. I asked where, and it happened to be a place I'd forgotten was familiar to me. I went across the road all the way up on the back side of the power line. Actually, I could almost see the interstate from where I was. You know where the yellow house is at the end of the road that we collect from, at the end of the Jolson Road, where we stop and park and then we collect from the tree line uh, right by the front of the grove, that yellow house? It wasn't until the yellow house that I knew exactly where my uncle was. It's a pretty home, sitting along a grove like he said. My grandfather would keep the tractor in the woods so when we hopped off to lift the buckets from the taps, we could look out beyond the tree line at this big field covered in undisturbed snow. If you look at that, if you look to the right of that house, if you're standing beside it, there's a power line that goes up over the hill. On the far end of that was where I was, when the interstate comes from Putney down through Brattleboro. That's where you can see it, right there, right before you turn the corner. You can see the Pepsi building and stuff like that. That's where I shot it, out there. I nodded, asking for more. It was the afternoon, I was out in the woods, I was hunting with my Uncle David, Uncle Faye, Dad, Gramp, and I saw a spike horn. It came up toward me, I shot it. My Uncle David showed up, he said, you're dear, you gotta clean it. So I cleaned it, and then I had to drag it all the way home by myself. Thank you, Abigail. Um, next, we're going to hear we're going to hear from Sophie Nadell, who I believe has assembled um, like a cast for an incredible excerpt from. There's a screenplay situation about to happen in this room, which is really exciting. And Sophie et al. will be followed by Lee Schwartz. So Lee, get ready. 
Um, so Sophie is, I believe, being introduced by Kathy DeMarco Van Cleve. So Kathy, come to the podium, please. I want to um, echo what Paul said. Uh, thank you, Julia, for this event, and thank you, Writers House. It's um, I don't know if Paul or other professors rushed here from their very last class of the semester, um, but it feels no, it's not. It feels actually that's what I want to say. You get here and you kind of like oh, take a deep breath. We're in the place where writing breathes, and and we get to relax finally after this semester and celebrate these great writers. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, what a joy to um, introduce Sophie. I actually, as I was um, rushing over here and thinking what I wanted to say, I had two different stories uh, from my own past, which was when I first started working in like the writing field way back in 1993, you guys were not born. Um, I remember I, we got to, it was for a TV movie producer and a writer, we were based in New York, so we'd meet all these playwrights. And I, I think it was a playwright named, um, it was either Wendy Wasserstein or Tina Howe. It was a female playwright. And they were just extraordinary. And when they left, I, I was awed. And someone said, well, of course, writers, they're always the best. You know, you always want to talk to writers. Um, and that is true about Sophie. And all, actually, I know a lot of you doing this today. So I'd say about all of you. Um, Sophie is just a joy. And she is a consummate writer. She is she almost can't help herself. She's so imaginative and she's so creative and she's so honest in a way that um, I find not only compelling, but as a human, honestly, my tear, my eyes are welling up. I just think she is has not just definitely immense potential as a creative writer, but as a person. She, she absolutely subscribes to that, what that person said to me so long ago, writers are the most interesting people. Um, on the other, on another story, when I was teaching here, we had a, um, a big partner at a talent agency called CIA come and speak to one of our classes. And he said, I asked him, and he represented all kinds of fancy people, and, and um, but not writers. He like represented, I don't know, Ryan Seacrest. Um, and he said, uh, I said, well, what do you like best about your job? And he said, oh, well, what's the most magical? The writers. I mean, they get to create something out of nothing. I think of it as some kind of, you know, it's just magic. And that also is something I thought of today when I was driving over here about Sophie. Well, you're about to hear, and I don't know which section she's chosen. Um, like, this is going to be a story about a 12-year-old girl. Well, let me stop. And I'm going to set it up a little bit for you, Sophie, if that's okay. Because we've been. I feel like I've been teaching Sophie forever. And that's not true. But I think I've taught you for four years. She's not only taken my three classes. She's TA'd for me twice, right? Just once. Well, you audited once and then she also did concurrently with this honors thesis another honors thesis this semester this year this whole year um so i feel like i know of what i speak when i say <laughs> of uh sophie's capacious imagination so the world building of and what you're about to hear is there's a um there is a universe we're all maybe live in a universe where we can rent out ghosts or phantoms who have unfinished business left on earth and just like the dmv you can go to the pra the phantom rental agency and you can summon them if you're lucky enough to have psychic abilities um you can summon them and then someone will come and right kind of and and help you on your own life's journey as you attend to the unfinished business but you can only summon these phantoms if you have psychic abilities, which our hero, who you're about to hear from, Casey, 12-year-old, 12, 13, 12, um, has, is going through some stuff, divorced parents, new school, um, unhappy in some pretty basic, uh, basic 12-year-old ways and singular 12-year-old um, ways. And she somehow summons up a biker who died like 30 years ago, right? Luther. And... Um, and they both go on this journey together through the script. I, I couldn't be more proud of her. I, I find Sophie fascinating. I find her knitting fascinating. If you know her, you know what that means. Um, and I just can't wait to see what she comes up with, not just today, but in the future. So it's my pleasure to introduce her.
<laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. It's been really fun working on my two thesis projects with you. So this excerpt uh, picks up in the first act. Um, our hero, Casey, has recently summoned, the night before, summoned a crazy biker ghost spirit, Luther, who is now trying to convince her to drop everything and go on a journey with him to solve his unfinished business. So we have Charlie will be Luther. Delaney will be Casey, um, Izzy will be Remy, and Beck will be Chris, and I will be doing stage directions. Interior, school bus, day. Obnoxious pop music plays in the back. Casey is the only person in her seat. Luther floats next to her. Ready to cut a deal? I've given it some thought, and I think my business has got to be in Reno where I died. I don't want anything. Heartless. I open up to you about the sensitive issue of my death and get nothing. Think carefully about this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for you, but if you don't want anything, I might have some other ways to get you to help me. Luther drapes an arm around her. Of course, I'd rather not have to hurt anyone, if you know what I mean, but I'm capable. Rode with a notorious biker gang back in my living days. Luther shows Casey the back of his nuclear moth's jacket. He is way too proud of it. I don't, I don't know what I would want from a ghost. Luther looks around. I'd bet you'd rather go to Disneyland. What? Tell you what. I'll possess the bus driver, and we'll all go to Disneyland. Don't possess the bus driver. I'm a fantastic driver. Only got a few dozen speeding tickets when I was alive. Do not possess the bus driver. What was that? Possess the bus driver? Sure thing. No, don't! Other kids look up. Casey's a weirdo. She sinks down. Meanwhile, Luther fades into the bus driver. The driver's mouth splits into a smile. He flexes his fingers and leans forward. Shots of the gas pedal compressed. The bus driver's manic grin possessed. The bus lurches forward. Kids fall back into their seats. A few shrieks. Cut to exterior. Susie's bus stop. Same. Susie, nine, waits for her bus with a blue backpack and pigtails. It shoots past her, 65 miles per hour and climbing. Return to interior school bus. Same. Close on Casey. Embarrassment gone. Furious. She wrangles herself into the aisle, grabs the bus driver, Luther's shoulders. I told you to stop! It's like an electromagnetic force bursts from Casey. We see flashes, a stampede of motorcycles whirring, a woman's mouth screaming, the clear night sky getting farther away. Return to present. Casey's hand flashes silver, uh, and she pulls Luther out of the bus driver. The bus driver panics, and the bus slows. Kids turn to each other. The heck was that? What was that for? Are you trying to exercise me? But Casey isn't listening to Luther. She's staring at her hand and crying. She had a vision. You're angry. You're goddamn right I am. Do you think I can, you can control me with that pathetic display? Not at me. Don't tell me who I'm mad at. You're angry. Furious. You're upset. So upset. Regretful? What the hell are you talking about? You're a vengeful spirit. Long shot. It's Casey, alone in the aisle. Kids stare at her, whispering to each other. Hey, sit down. That's the bus driver, who I didn't cast, so it'll be me. Um, interior, middle school classroom, later. Casey flips through a book entitled Beyond the Brain, Myths on the Sixth Sense, and takes notes. Meanwhile, Remy shows Chris something funny on her phone instead of reading. Exterior, middle school playground, same. Luther stands cross-armed at the kickball diamond, alone, fuming. He bounces an abandoned kickball with ghost telepathy. Images flash, a woman yelling, a door slam, a boy, six, crying. Close on Luther. I'm not a vengeful spirit. That's, that's not why I'm stuck. The kickball hits the ground with unnatural speed. It breaks. Luther turns as students shove out of the building, dividing and conquering the playground. A boy carries a kickball and leads a sizable pack of eager kickballers. Among them is Remy. Uh, Casey trails behind. She and Luther meet eyes. Hey, where's Chris? Chris bursts outside and sprints to Casey. You Kickball told kids watch. Sorry. You told on me? I didn't. The alligator told me that I excluded you when I clearly didn't. Doesn't she get that the teams aren't even? Yeah, come on. Not cool. Fine. You want to play so much? Sure. Hey, everyone. The teams are going to be uneven. Descent. Why don't you just play on your own team? Yeah, I don't want to be on the same team as a snitch. I never told. All kickball kids march into the outfield. Casey is alone on home plate. Chris stands on the pitcher's mound. Luther watches. This is crazy. Kickball is a team sport. Are you ready? Anyone? No one? 
Silence. Casey stands alone, her eyes narrow. Screw everyone. Fine, then. Challenge accepted. Chris theatrically bowls to Casey. She sends it flying into the far outfield. It is an impressive kick, but there are no openings among the 20 people against her. Remy catches it. Out! Chris serves again. Casey kicks low. Chris scoops it up and tosses it to Ian on first base before Casey makes it. Out! That's two outs. Casey pants back to home. Chris smiles and serves the final time. Casey breathes in, focuses intently on the ball. She pulls back, connects, and it's another fly ball, soaring easily into Mia's hands. But wait, just before Mia can catch it, the ball changes direction and hits the ground. Casey's on first. Mia! One boy races to the ball, but it bounces with unnatural force and nails him in the face. The ball rebounds and soars past Remy as she reaches for it. Casey's on second, still running. Chris reaches the ball, but it rolls away. He reaches again, and it rolls another way. He pounces on it. Casey's on third. She looks around, sees Chris with the ball, sees home, and Luther, standing in the basement path, smirking, arm extended for a high five. She smiles. A race between Casey and Chris. Casey's POV. Outfielders manifest aura in all colors. The colors intensify. Casey's heart beats. Her breath is loud. She staggers, slows. On Chris... Surrounded by a feeble aura that resembles a ripped cloth, he's catching up to her. On Luther, he reacts to Chris's closing in and gestures. The ball flops out of uh, Chris's hands. Chris looks at his empty hands and collides with Casey. His aura encapsulates her. As soon as they touch, she sees a hospital. Ki Chris and his dad watch, ho watch doctors treat his mother. Chris's bedroom. Chris throws his textbook against the wall, frustrated. He doubles over and cries. Casey stops. She steps away. The auras vanish. Chris recovers the ball. He dives at Casey. Her face contorts. Out! Chris's team cheers. Casey's eyes swell. She flees. Exterior. Back wall of the school. Day. Casey hunches against the brick wall, crying. Luther fades through the wall. What's the matter with you? You're about to give all of those suckers a punch in the gut. No response. Is it me? Did you not want me to help you? No way you could have shown them up solo. No, I saw something. It was weird. What? Everyone started glowing, all these rainbow colors. Chris had like a, a murky energy coming off him. There was so much sadness, and now it's on me, I think. What's that mean? Like, I feel sad and tired, and my head hurts. Could be puberty. <laughs> That's where I'm leaving it. Thank you. And thank you so much to my actors for coming in and supporting me. Thank you so much, Sophie and cast. All right, next we're going to hear from Lee Schwartz, and Lee's going to be introduced by Anthony DeCurtis, who's going to join us magically with the powers of Zoom. So while we're queuing up Anthony, um, I'll just take this opportunity to say there are a bunch of seats up front. If anyone would like to come up and snag a chair, please don't be shy about coming all the way up front. There's plenty of space up here. Um, and it looks like Anthony is here. So Anthony, welcome virtually to the Kelly Writers House, here to introduce Lee Schwartz. Thank you, Julia, and thanks, as always, to Zach, of course, the uh, IT genius who uh, set this up. Uh, unfortunately, um, I couldn't be in Philadelphia today. I'm in my office in New York, but um, I did want to speak about Lee and her project, which um, was quite extraordinary. We had an amazing semester, and um, uh, as I recall, uh, I think the first time I met Lee, uh, when she enrolled in my arts and popular culture seminar, um, she mentioned uh, the possibility of this uh, thesis and the possibility of, of my being her advisor on it. And I immediately said, sounds completely fascinating. You know, the, the premise is a kind of exploration of the um, years and hundreds of pages of journal entries that Lee wrote when she was a young teenager. And part of that was a conversation with her future self, future self that she is in part has become. So it was um, a kind of extraordinary journey, uh, a journey of self-examination, uh, one in which uh, 
kind of identity became an issue and it was it was tricky at points you know i admire lee for her willingness to kind of dive in and really um try to extricate a current self out of all these previous selves and um you know the uh, thesis is called teenagehood uh, a conversation between selves and um we'll hear part of it and i know you'll be um as gripped by it as I was. So I'm very proud to uh, introduce Lee Schwartz. Thanks. I forgot to tee up our two readers. So just one second. Um, after we hear from Lee, we are going to hear from Aaron Brennan, followed by Margaret Dunn. Welcome, Lee. Hi, my name is Lee. I'm going to be reading a few of my journal entries for you um, and my present reflection on them, starting with October 29th, 2014. Today, I went to IHOP for Grandma's birthday. There was not a person younger than 60 there. At the table across from us, I saw a man in a wheelchair. He had one of those oxygen tube things in his nose, wrapping around him. He had a bib on and a bright red face. Eyes like the pinky milk blind ones of naked mole rats you see at the zoo. They looked like marbles pushed into clay. It was scary. For most of the dinner, I was watching him, maybe a bit guiltily. He probably could not see me, and he had a nurse push blended IHOP into his mouth. I wondered what it was like to be old. I wonder if he knows how old he is. That time has even passed. What is he thinking about? Middle school? Or maybe not even thinking. Maybe it's all a haze. One hundred years from now, I could be him. Only aware of fleeting memories. Of walking the halls at Westland Middle School. The feel of my parents' king-sized bed. And the vibrant leaves of the oak tree in front of my childhood home. I'm scared of change. I hate change. I want to freeze and never move. But at the same time, I want things to change. See what I'll become. I want to document my whole life so that I forget nothing. I'll need all of my memories one day, if I'm like that IHOP guy. That's enough for now. There's so much more I want to write, but it's 10 p.m. and I have school tomorrow. <laughs> December 2nd. 2014. Future Lee, I haven't told you enough about my life lately, so I need to give you a report. Here's everything you need to know. Number one, I'm still single. <laughs> Number two, it's getting harder to maintain my grades, but they're still good. I'm still bad at math. Number three, Dan Navratil keeps mooching off of my TikToks, my Tic Tacs in my locker. <laughs> Number four, I'm enjoying myself as an eighth grader and being able to make fun of the Sevies, the seventh graders. <laughs> Number five, I'm still myself. Now I'm going to ask some questions about you because I'm endlessly curious about where you are now, future Lee. I'm leaving the next few lines blank for a response. Here are my questions. One, are you still single? <laughs> Two, have you had your first kiss yet? Three, are you cool? <laughs> Four, depending on how old you are, were you successful in life? <laughs> Five, do you have a daughter? <laughs> and in the space provided, hello, it's Lee on June 19th, 2017. I'm rereading my journal entries to bring to Julian, our therapist, no surprise there, <laughs> so I can show her our behavior. I'm still single, nothing has happened. Have a great day, future Lee. No daughter yet. We'll keep you updated. <laughs> hey again. It's Lee on June 4th, 2018. I'm rereading my journal for college essay material. I actually had my first kiss about a month after the previous check-in. No daughter yet. <laughs> Junior year is so stressful. April 30th, 2016. I lean my head on the window, cheek pillowed on my hand. 
I smell the sharp tang of the city street, the industrial metallic smell. I stare at the street below me, and I think that years from now, and miles away, I could be staring at a street and smelling the same smell, living a whole new life. I think about how different things could be ten years later, even five years later. Time feels like all of these realities where I'm 13 or 15 or 20. I see myself doing the same thing, smelling the same smell, years away. And I wonder if that girl is thinking about me right now. Will the present me be able to recognize future me if they met on the street? July 10th, 2019. I've been getting this feeling that things will never be exactly like this again. I stare up at the stars as my body floats in a well-fleet pond. We're swimming under the night sky. It feels so intense and vivid, but my mind is so jumbled with the past. It's like my childhood sleepaway camp. I'll never feel that forest walk back to my cabin again. I'll never see these stars and feel this water. My friends will never know each other like we know each other now. I am 18 years old, and I miss camp. Why can't I be that girl again in my bunk? I hear the Cape Cod bullfrogs in my chest tightens. It's exactly like when I was 12. Those same bullfrogs outside my screen window in cabin 38. I want to be her again. I can't go back. Even as I'm surrounded by friends, walking home barefoot on the dry forest ground, wrapped in a towel, I already want to go back to the present. I'm making no sense. It's so hard to enjoy a moment when I ache for the past, when I fear every passing moment as it's happening. Is it like this for everyone? What makes me so time warped? Will it stop hurting? Future Lee is supposed to be older and reminisces with no pain. It doesn't hurt her to look back. January 19th, 2021. Every moment of 2021 has been agonizing. <laughs> I finally will be 20 in a month. There's no searching for memories that I didn't write down. Teenagehood is dead, and I feel as if I'm dying too. Why does growth feel like a loss? I'm sad. I belong as a teenage girl. Nothing has ever felt so right as living the past seven years of my life. How can I know that the rest of my life will be just as right? I don't feel right right now. I haven't felt right since college. The only and terrible answer is that I think too much. It doesn't matter if I write down something five years from now. Twenty means nothing. And neither does what comes after it. Twenty-year-old Lee has been such a mystical figure my entire life. All of my letters and promises to my future self were all for her. I would ask if she was happy, if she feels the same things, if she could understand. It was a figure I was never actually supposed to be. All of a sudden, the future is present, and it's collapsing into one, and I wish I could be that 14-year-old girl who asked me if the wet DC asphalt still smelled like metal, who had asked me if she had ever been kissed. I'm afraid it will just end simply. For so long, I've either tried to hold on to a present moment or wished to go back and relive it. When I turn 20, I may not even write. It will just be a moment. In Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, Billy Pilgrim becomes unstuck in time. Billy is sent to relive past or future moments of his life, even between Earth and another planet, Chalfamador. The extraterrestrial Chalfamadorians exist in all moments, collapsing past, present, and future. When young Lee converses with her future self, she sees all versions of her existence at the same time. She reaches out for support and understanding from these versions of herself. To her, she is as much her past self as her present and future selves. While she does not unstick in time and travel like Billy Pilgrim, and their experiences are nowhere near the same, she is stuck in the past. Her future self is a lifeline, and her past is her refuge. 
Like Billy, hiding in her past makes her comfortable, and she revisits moments of assured happiness. When Billy Pilgrim becomes unstuck, he travels. When Lee becomes unstuck, she can finally live in the present. To both, it is freedom. And to both, the fragmentation of life and veneration of the past is what brings together important moments and aspects of their lives closer. The hundreds of journal entries I wrote did this. It is both a blessing and a curse. If young Lee got her wish, if she could live life out of order and relive the past, choosing what to experience, does past mean anything at all? What matters is this moment, for we are bugs in amber. In one of my entries, I wrote I wanted to exist and just be. I wanted my life to not have to be anything in particular. And I might have been getting at the truth, if just for a moment. Maybe the answer is really simple. Even if that IHOP guy had choked on blended pancake, in the now, he was seated. Comfortable. Maybe tasting maple syrup. And that was enough. The feeling of not being in pain. Of sweetness. We don't know. And we can't know. The happy ending is realizing that the happy ending is now. It is what you make it. The happy is not looking to the past or relying on future me. It is me right now. In every journal entry about the weather, my outfit that day, the fleeting feeling of being understood by friends and of doing something crazy, real happiness has been there the whole time. Happiness is there if you choose it and choose to become unstuck in the past. There's no way for me to communicate with my 13-year-old self, even if for her time is not linear, and all of the versions of myself are overlapping and converging. But there is a way to put her to rest. You are not going to learn who you are by where you've been. Young Lee could have used the Trophimadorians in some respect to tell her, why you? Why us? for that matter. Why anything? Because this moment simply is. There is no why. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Next, we're going to hear from Erin Brennan. Erin will be followed by Margaret Dunn. Um, and introducing Erin is Nova Rensuma. These readings are wonderful. Isn't it? It's just like, what a wonderful, wonderful evening. OK. I'm on my tippy toes. <laughs> OK. I am honored and delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Erin Brennan, who will be reading an excerpt from her honors thesis, which was the opening section of a YA fantasy novel called Dark as Ash. This is a novel full of invention, high stakes action, and forbidden and ferocious magic. It was a true pleasure to witness Erin embrace the world building of this fantasy novel and see the extraordinary effort she put into creating complex power structures and magic systems, all while deepening a dynamic protagonist who YA readers will want to follow. Erin was a student in my writing for young adults class last spring, which is where the work of this novel first began to emerge. But in fact, that's only this iteration and this current version of the story. Because as she speaks to in her thoughtful and in-depth critical commentary, this is an idea that first came to her when she was in the sixth grade, when fantasy novels and the creation of one were a coping mechanism. She has come a long way from that beanbag chair in her childhood bedroom, where the idea first entered her mind, to all the intensive work that she has done to be here today. What I've admired is how every aspect of her experience and the courses she took at Penn found their way into the creation of this world in some way or another. There is nuance and research and so much heart that went into the telling of this story and into the planning of this intricate and explosive plot. Erin took to the writing of a novel for young adults with an openness and the desire to work to get it right. 
In her commentary, Erin engages with some of the deep questions facing the YA category today and considers the great power and responsibility that comes when creating a world aimed at a readership of young adults. So I am so happy to congratulate and welcome Erin Brennan and hear an excerpt from this incredible novel. Thank you so much, Nova. Um, Lee had me tearing up a little bit back there, so excuse me if I'm a bit emotional. Um, I'm going to be reading from chapters four and five of my novel, so to give a little bit of context, um, the protagonist of this story is a teenage girl named Ebony, and she possesses these magical fire powers in a world where magic is illegal. And she's also in training to be a part, to be an agent in this elite military squad that basically hunts down magic users. Um, so she has just been on her first training mission and she has royally effed up the whole thing. So she's about to face the consequences of that mistake. Chapter four. The journey passes in relative silence as my team and I process the disintegration of our first training mission. Within an hour, the forest below begins to clear and the landscape morphs into a familiar urban haven at the edge of the cliffs that overlook the Eastern Sea. Is Riga, the glittering capital at the heart of the Ismayan Empire. The city radiates outward in ripples, each ring its own awkward conflation of ornate architecture from the, area of, from the era of certain conquest, and towering metal structures which mark the Madari dynasty's reign over this region. The city is a living, breathing contradiction, at once modern and ancient, order and chaos, back straight with pride in its Ismayan rulers and hunched with the weight of thousands of years of occupation by various powers across the continent. Even the far south and northern states have left their marks on this land, peeking through Ardesian thatched roofs of the agricultural sector, Britomiri style gardens and residential courtyards, and sprawling manors once reserved for the noble houses of Catan that still line the borders between the old city and New Isriga. In the very center of the old city stands the palace complex, with its shimmering certain spires, reinforced walls, and state-of-the-art military barracks. One day, my place will be within those mighty stone walls, training alongside heroes to the crown in the unregistered magic containment force. One day, if I manage to avoid expulsion from the academy after today's antics. Lost in a daydream in which I'm captain of my own UMCF tactical squad, I almost miss the telltale sound of Kazran approaching, steady and sure-footed as always. So, you're alive. No thanks to you, I mutter, tearing my gaze from the window to look them in the eye at last. Do you expect an apology? Kaz shoots back, co cocking an eyebrow. I followed orders. You would do the same. At least, you usually would. I don't miss the suggestion in Kaz's words, but when I offer no explanation, they dig in further. You found something, didn't you? I don't know what you mean. They give me a look that reduces my every shred of armor to a window pane. I never could hide my emotions from Kaz, not after everything we've shared with one another. I found something, I admit. Just his name in one of the files. I'm sure Hawthorne saw it too. No doubt he'll hold it against you, if he isn't ratting you out to Sim as we speak. You always know how to cheer me up, I sigh. Kaz grins. I'm glad you're not dead. I glare at them, but the icy tension between us has melted into water. It cools the raging monster in me until the flaming bunker is a distant memory. How did you know? I muse. I know you, says Kaz. I know there's only one reason you'd go rogue on a mission like this. Word of advice, though? Don't let revenge cloud your judgment. It only leads to ruin, I should know. I bite back the urge to defend myself and replace it with a solemn nod. For Kaz, the age of division is not, a, is not merely a distant memory, clouded in the innocence of childhood. After they lost both their parents in a night raid carried out by certain guerrilla forces, Kaz turned to the gangs of Izrika. Criminals did not care about their background or identity so long as they could aim a gun and shoot it without flinching. And for many years, Kaz didn't flinch. What Kaz's mentors should have known was that grief left to fester becomes a parasite, more infectious than the plague and more explosive than gunpowder. And Kaz carried the grief of a nation within their narrow frame. Kaz knew the cost of unity better than anyone. Though the Treaty of Diadella finally incorporated Serta into the Ismayan Empire when we were just children, Kaz never forgot the raiders that killed their family, 
or the violence and disorder that allowed criminals like them to slip between the cracks. When one day they caught their reflections staring back at them with the same violence in their eyes, Kaz turned in their own gang leaders in exchange for a place at the academy. They learned to swallow the iron tang of revenge and turn their bitterness into a weapon for peace. I know there are pieces of Kaz's story that they still hold close to their heart, perhaps even atrocities they'll never admit to having committed in a past life. I don't mind the secrets, not when I have so many of my own to protect. Each of us clawed our way onto the squad for a reason, and Kaz is the only one who could possibly understand my contempt for the coalition of rebel groups that now calls itself the United Front. It's little wonder that they're also my only friend at the Academy. We watch in silence while the helicopter cruises toward the military district, encased in a w maze of steel walls on the outskirts of the city. The sight should look familiar, even comforting. But today, unease curls in my stomach as I dread the tongue lashing that surely awaits me in the debriefing room. Chapter 5. My future dangles on a fragile web of lies, and all I can think about is how badly my wrist throbs. My team and I were brought straight to the med bay upon landing at the Academy's helipad. Protocol demanded that we be inspected and treated for any injuries before debriefing the mission, though miraculously the only wound in need of stitches was the gash in my wrist where I sliced out my tracker. The replacement they installed is thinner, an even newer prototype than the last, but it pushes against the stitches nonetheless. The pressure mingles with the flames under my skin, mounting into a deadly wave yet again, as if my last explosion weren't enough to rid me of the curse forever. As expected, our debriefing has quickly devolved into an interrogation, aided by the occasional goading smirk from Symphony, who at least has enough sense to keep her mouth shut while our superior officer is speaking. The Commandant has Symphony's tightly coiled hair and steely gray stare with none of the youthful attitude and all of the authority. Her every word strikes me like flint on stone, and my fingers tingle with the sparks that I fight to keep inside. You're suspended from all training exercises until the examination board may run a proper investigation, the Commandant announces with the finality of a death sentence. The examination board, meaning my father and the other officers who supervise final examinations at the academy, who determine our placements, or lack thereof, now hold my fate in their hands. As much as I'd like to believe Father will advocate for me, I know he cannot risk his reputation by overstepping. My eyes dart to Kaz's in desperation, though I don't know just what I'm pleading for. Kaz doesn't either. They attempt a reassuring smile, but we both know an investigation by the examination board means, at best, an insubordination mark on my record. At the very worst, expulsion. Symphony's smug smile breaks into a crevasse of perfectly menacingly straight teeth. The tingling spreads outward until both my arms are encased in a phantom inferno. Understood, Commandant. I choke out, trying not to let the mounting tremble in my bones escape into my voice. All around me, my teammates stare on as I'm stripped bare by those two words. Eternities pass on in agonizing silence, my, mo my body heat rising to a treacherous degree, before Commandant Nwambe finally dismisses us. We salute her one by one, but no one else makes a move to leave the debriefing room, even after the click of the commandant's boots fades far into the distance. Just when I think my humiliation has reached its peak, Sim cuts the silence with a scoff. She's never been one to let anyone have the last word, even if it's one of defeat. You're just like your brother, she spits, savoring each word as if they've been simmering on her tongue for hours or maybe years. Can't follow a single order to save your life. No wonder he got himself killed. And that's all it takes me to erupt, not in words, but in blazing, searing, damning flames. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. We are halfway through our reading. It's really beautifully atmospheric in here with the rain falling outside. So next we're gonna hear from Margaret Dunn and Margaret will be followed by Peyton Toops. And I am going to introduce Margaret. Margaret's advisor, Waiki Wong, could not be here tonight, but shared some remarks for me to share with all of you. So this is, this is from Waiki. Margaret was, was first my student in my fiction workshop class. It was our first in-person semester after COVID. And with everyone masked for all of that semester, I only saw half her face. Margaret was a great student, which means she was a student I never had to worry about. Respectful, prompt, someone who sat in the back but was always eager to raise a hand. Then I read her first story, and I was taken not just by her very good sentences, though that would have been enough, but by her fluency with what a short story can contain, how far the writer can push characters and readers through a finite journey. 
Margaret's collection, Babies, contains six stories so polished I would liken each to a pearl. We follow a wannabe actor at the frightening brink of adulthood, Floridian girls in the throes of a difficult friendship, a couple with a pet pig who is pregnant, and a disenchanted college grad working in a bar where waitresses are called kittens. I could not have written these stories as an undergrad or even a grad student. The creative range that Margaret establishes is astounding. The depth of emotion, the clarity, yet ambiguity of human relations, the finesse with a capital F. Margaret already has a distinct style, already has the intuition. And with these attributes, style and intuition, she has traits that take even the best writers years to develop. I wish I could say I taught her them, but alas, our thesis meetings were always energized, maybe even too productive. I think Mikey means I didn't teach all these skills to <laughs> Margaret, but she had them had them to begin with. Um, but what re- what it really does come down to are the sentences, and one after another, Margaret delivers. This proud advisor hopes this young writer will never stop writing. These stories belong out there and will find their loyal readership in due time. Please help me welcome Margaret Dunn. Hi, everybody. Um, Thank you, Waiki. That was so, so nice. Um, You've been a lovely and exceptional advisor, and I'm so happy to have you. Um, Today, I'm going to be reading the first half of a story I wrote called Diet Cola Babies. (laughs) It was the thick of summer, and I'd been sleeping on a mattress on the floor of my grandpa's sunroom. Needed a change of scene, my parents agreed, and he owned a little place outside of Tampa. I told them I liked it okay, and they didn't push me on it. Fell in hard with Judith and them, Ruth and Carmen, who'd offer to curl my hair and cut holes in the right parts of my jeans. At 15, they had two years on me and their bodies looked it, but Judith would rest her arms on my shoulders and insist that I was an old soul. She was one too, she'd whisper, and that's why we got on like a house on fire. The night I see as the start of most of it was hot, so we held ice cubes to our temples as we walked our way to the strip mall, sat and leafed through magazines in the aisles of a drugstore. Judith had me put back the one I'd been reading. They call it 17 to get you, kid, knowing all the younger girls will reach for it. She tapped a finger to her forehead, so the content is all for babies. You think boys read girl magazines and get off, Carmen asked. No, they have a different kind for that. You think Ian does? Do I look like I know, Judith asked. But yes, I think he does. I've seen him at St. Teresa's, so Ruth murmured. That means fuck all, Ruth, and I'm pretty sure he's a cafeteria Catholic, Judith replied. Ian was a boy we knew, 17 maybe. Had a cross tattooed on his wrist that Judith liked to poke at. Whenever we saw him, we'd be sure to stand stand in his eyeline for a bit. Outside, it was buggy. A few older kids sat on a bench and passed a blunt between them. When Judith saw, she shepherded us into an alley, tied her top up around her ribs, and did ours the same way. There was one of those palm readers on the corner, two lawn chairs beside a folding table. Judith sat down, chewing out her straw and watching the woman. Refused to leave until she said she'd be famous one day, and that Farrah Fawcett and Michael Jackson are drinking margas in heaven. Spicy ones. A skinny one for Farrah, Carmen laughed. And a skinny one for Farrah. Finally, the palm reader gave in, prophesying with her eyes closed and beads shaking. Judith pocketed a hand mirror from the table as she did. We clutched each other, left crescent moons on forearms, and only let the laughter go in the thick of the crowds. She's going to curse you or something, Jude, Ruth said. Let her. My life sucks already, she replied. At least now I can do eyeliner on the fly. As we left that night, we saw Ian climb into the Buick of an older girl. Without words, the four of us followed, Judith sitting up on my handlebars with her hood pulled down. The streets were dark by then, and we cut across yards and over curbs. Came to a split level with a nativity shrine out front. Shut the fuck up, Judith whispered, but I could see the white of her teeth. We crouched low in the bushes, felt bugs jump at our shins. A car door closed, and there were footsteps on the porch, a laugh we knew only from afar as Ian's. A dog barked somewhere, and Judith's hand was sweaty over my mouth. Shut up. In a moment, it was still, and she was peering around the fence, taking the steps it took to reach the window. Judith never told us what she saw that night, only gestured at it vaguely, the hint that it was something earth-shattering. And the more we pried, reaching for it, asking or bartering, the more she would shake her head, smile and fall silent. My grandpa would wait up for me sometimes, and other times he wouldn't. Always in the mornings, I'd find him in the kitchen on the last pages of a paper, bacon and eggs on the stove. I'd sit and ask him about what we watched the night before, and he'd ask me about the girls. That morning, I told him how we'd spent the day at the water, wetting and flipping our hair back to look like the founding fathers. You're burned, he said. We lied out for a bit, yeah. Kept our toes in the shade because the sun can cause wrinkles that web them down there. What? I don't know. He sighed something about chum in the water and turned the page. I didn't ask what he meant. 
On the paper's cover was an article about the man that police had arrested behind the Dave and Busters. You heard about this? He tapped a finger to it, a wet lump of eggs in his throat. It took them a month, a month to gotch that creep. Pervert had been taking it out and following kids home. I was one of those kids but never told anyone. The man's thighs were white like milk. Ruth and Carmen had jobs during the day, so it was mostly the two of us, me and Judith. I liked it like that, how she would cross her legs over mine in the grass and whisper things she didn't say in front of the other girls. And Ruth, Jesus, you can't get an icy with no syrup and still call it an icy. You're just eating ice. Yeah, totally. You just going to agree with everything I say, kid? Judith laughed. Yeah, I mean, no. The town was sleepy and there wasn't much to do, but Judith could make the day full. Would ring the doorbell at the Hambright's house, both of us barefoot and uninvited sit with our thighs up on the kitchen counter and watch as Mrs. Hambright cared for her baby. Can I hold her, Judith would ask. Mrs. Hambright had us sit, us on, the, sit on the floor, the baby in Judith's lap. I've always wanted a little sister, she'd say. You have sisters, I replied. No, a little one, she murmured, running a finger over the baby's chest. I've only got older ones, and they've all moved out. But I guess you're my sister, too. Really? She nodded. Sometimes Mrs. Hambright would let us into the kiddie pool in the backyard, only if it was really hot and Judith complained that she had heat stroke. The baby wasn't allowed, but we could put our feet in. One day, as we waited with the hose going, Judith used two of the baby's dolls to show me what making love was. That can't be right, I said. Mrs. Hambright called to Judith from the house. It is. Mrs. Hambright called again, and she dropped the dolls, walked back toward the porch. I braided some grass. Beside me, the white plastic legs stuck up straight in the air. It was my grandpa who first suggested that maybe Judith didn't want to go home. She'd sat on his couch with her feet up on my lap until nine, and when he told her it was time to go, she asked to use the bathroom. When he'd come back to the den, she'd be on the couch again, a Fruit Loops carton held between her legs. Inside, her hand rooted around for a toy. You stay here any longer, we're going to have to start giving you chores, he said. Out with Judith's hand came a scattering of cereal and a doll. I'll do anything as long as it's not pulling hair from the drain. Can't stand doing that. But whatever else, I'm game. He stood there looking at her mouth open. Then just after a moment, she broke to a smile, began to laugh, and dust the Fruit Loops from her shorts just pulling her leg. My grandpa half nodded, and she stood up, tossing the doll to me. And Christ, look at the waist on her, huh? I'd walked Judith half the way home, so we both stood an equal chance at abduction. Before we parted that night, she insisted on running through a neighbor's sprinklers. We were breathless and laughing, and then she had stopped to look at herself in the window of a parked car, wring the water from her hair. You think I'm pretty? Of course. I think I might be too, Judith murmured. And today something happened that told me I might be. I had to press her on it. She did that thing where she held it up over your head so you'd ask and jump and beg. Finally, she gave in, looking at the little gap between her teeth. Today, I was walking home from the beach to meet you, walking backwards on the street so my T-shirt could dry in the sun, and this red pickup passed, and it honked at me. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. So next, we're going to hear from Peyton Toops. After Peyton, we're going to hear from Raja Pramage. Um, I'm going to introduce Peyton because I am Peyton's thesis advisor. Peyton's poems are about what happens when we look at pop culture and see ourselves reflected there, or maybe about what happens when we look at pop culture and don't see ourselves reflected there exactly, but see a version of ourselves that might be possible. Peyton and I share a sometimes ambivalent, sometimes sheepishly enthusiastic, and always unabashed love for what pop culture can teach us about politics, about intimacy, about ethics. But what I really learned from working on this thesis is how tangled and multi-tentacled it can get when you start with the relatively pure joy of the pop song and find your way further to Pokemon, to the interface of the track list, to lockdown narratives and video games, to the distance and nearness of fandom. Poets like Peyton know that there has always been something queer about the pop song, the way it offers forms of desire that can shapeshift and break the rules and promise a different sort of future and present. As Peyton writes in Prelude, Evie, Normal, pretty impossible, I turn into what I desire. I'm really excited to hear Peyton read from poetry as pop song tonight. Please help me welcome him to the podium. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I acknowledge the um, mysterious middle folder, I have some acknowledgments. Um, first, I'd like to thank my mom and dad. Oh, and of course you, uh, Julia Block. Um, most importantly, um, I would also like to thank um, Kenneth Goldsmith, Sid Zolf, 
Ron Silliman, Jeff Johnson, and Jamie Lee Jocelyn. Because this started three years ago, and I finally finished it and like, like got a complete project um, this semester. But it all started in Jeffrey Cheese Johnson's class, uh, who's right there. Hi. Um, uh, in 2020, in the height of the pandemic. Um, and with that, the big reveal. Uh, I'm not going to be reading this in order, I decided, because you kind of already spoiled Prelude, Evie. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but here's Gracie now. I hope you can say. Uh, these weren't even for the thesis. They were for another class, but they all came related to the thesis, so I'm like, I might as well put it up here. Um, Glaceon, where am I? Where are you? Here we are. Um, it's, um, that's not... Okay, here we go. Glaceon Ice. Elsa said to let it go, but sometimes a grudge can harden to something more crystalline than anger. Miss Absolute Zero. Ice Fang. Always frozen. Cold causality breaks the picks of death. Sharpening around the corner. Justice can be a vodka or a duck. Whatever rests in the fairy tale glass lake of the mine. Glacial longing will landslide from your lips. Shards of desire pricking blood into Kool Aid. Godzilla shakes with mammoth heart. An Excalibur dragon heaving toward Algernon. And the chapless gallant courts the averted gaze of his companion. Watching you under ice without me, I find you a hound of love. Hunting that navy forest for centuries of sub zero silence. Um, the next poem has two posters with it, uh, if I can find them. It's called Nosferatu and Dracula Make Out in the Dark. Um, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, so, okay, this is Kate Bush, and this is Nosferatu. Um, uh, Nosferatu and Dracula Make Out in the Dark. Castles hurt with history, but at least we have each other's backs. Held to wooden stakes, I promise there's no silver bullet in the bedside table. The dark is only a cover for men, oblivion a shroud for the sold. We cloak ourselves in black nothingness without crisis. No one is out there in the night but us. I can see you just fine, putrid old man of desire. Your fingers are talons too sharp to make any puncture wound physical, too long to grasp at anything like meaning. Bats shadow across your wingspan. I trace the phantom of what was once lust like Adolon's sex. Flesh has always tasted better from the mouth of a snake. You would know there's a man's finger in my fang for you. You drag in my body to the inferno, a vampire in my neck and my back with German bruises. Cinema will never be the same without us. Um, and the next one is for all the Swifties in the room. Uh, they don't have a poster, unfortunately. I'm sorry, Taylor. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> this is called Wildest Woods, and I have to thank 1989. Um, welcome to you. Dreams this bad do shake. I know Blank Woods walled us off space. You get it, how the wish was to style. Girl, I would stay clean. All the places you love have blood out of New York. Um, I guess I'll actually do it. Uh, Megan Trainer, where are you? Um, oh, I forgot to thank Megan Trainer, Tara Swift, and Miley Cyrus in that order. But yes. Uh, one moment, here we are. Oh, and also, anyways, I could have my Gucci on, I could wear my Louis Vuitton, but even with nothing on, bet I made you look, I made you look. I'll make you double take soon as I walk away, call up your chiropractor just in case your neck break. I'll tell me what you, what you, what you gonna do. Cause I'm about to make a scene, double up that sunscreen, I'm about to turn the heat up, gonna make your glasses steam. Oh, tell me what you, what you, what you gonna do. Ooh. When I do my walk, walk, oh. I can, can guarantee your jaw will drop, drop, oh. Cause they don't make a lot of what I got, got, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Ladies, if you feel me, this your bop, 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 bop. I could have my Gucci on, Gucci on. I could wear my Louis Vuitton, fitting with nothing on. <laughs> I yeah, bet I made you look. I made you look. Yeah, I look good in my Versace dress. Take it off. But I'm hotter when my morning hair is a mess. Because even with my hoodie on, bet I made you look. I made you look. And once you get a taste, woo, you'll never be the same. This ain't that ordinary. This that 14 carat cake. Oh, tell me what you, what you, what you gonna do. Ooh. When I do my walk, walk, 
I can guarantee your jaw will drop. Drop. Because uh, they don't make a lot of what I got. Got. Ladies, if you feel me, this is your bop. Bop. Bop, bop, bop. Oh, I could have my Gucci on. Gucci on. I could wear my Louis Vuitton. But even with nothing on, but I made you look. Said I made you look. Yeah, I look good in my Versace dress. Take it off, baby. But I'm hotter when my morning hair is a mess. Because even with my hoodie on, but I made you look. Said I made you look. How much time do I have left? Oh, okay. Um, this next one is called Anne Sexton and Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Um, Mother Most Foul, Dark Type Pluck. Uh, wait, sorry. Mother Most Foul, Dark Type Pluck. Marble, Stumult, Snarl, Suburban Smile, Lyra Half Moon, Sparkle. The Metropolis is just off the map here in this loose leaf locket. You carry on like daybreak never happened. The courage never cleft in your palm. Normal like a poem in public is normal. A beauty meets another trainer on Route 3. The ensuing battle sparks a swarm of beedrills. Another hobby tossed for the Velvet Lady, who cannot smile and who is not Lana Del Rey. You take up this weird abundance, heels in hand, head of flame, and with hope, a fantasy best kept shut inside a coin purse. Um, Espeon, Espeon is right here. Uh, these are the Evie poems, uh, or one of the Evie poems, introduced ever so nicely by Evie, uh, as you mentioned. Psychic as shorthand for magic, Alien in the daytime, a lift body can do more for the mind than any number of mental exercises. Stretch your claws in the afternoon sunlight and think of your next target, a man, a merchant, a mall. Now whisk away negative thoughts with the swish of your tail. Sidebeam serotonin up and up and up into the sunshine. Powers originating from the brain need not be relegated to synapses and cinctures. With the right mindset, thoughts can be physical too. Size shocked reality. Here's one. Take your left shoulder and your right palm and turn it sideways. Now take your right elbow and angle it 90 degrees from your last pit of anguish. It can be located in your throat, your chest, or your stomach. Now unwind and sit still in a chair. Is that better? Do you feel clear-headed in this wonder room? Here's another. Insert more instructions here. Uh, okay. Uh, this is the postlude, actually, which will... Uh, inscriptions of 19 plates. Shout out to Arceus. Uh, platinum love in the shape of music note Tint your hands into a giant's home Make room for the ultimate Here awaiting destiny is a more hopeful pastime Fate strict like physics Lavishing the halo reach bathhouse of divine Where a mural steams Rigid, aids and pearl, crude angelic drawing Of a heart stopped once In time, things look smaller from the other side of the earth Thank you Do I think he's looking? Thank you so much, Peyton. So next we're gonna hear from Raja Pramage, and after Raja, Helen Wu will be reading. So Raja's um, advisor, Max Apple, couldn't be here tonight, but was kind enough to send me some remarks to read on his behalf. So this is Max. I first met Raja two years ago in a nonfiction class on Zoom. Eventually we'll stop needing to say that in some of our introductions. When he showed up in a fiction class a year later, it took me a while to stop seeing him in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. He's been a fine writer from the start, imaginative, in control of language, and with a good sense of fun. He showed the same qualities in fiction, but made a more major move in the last few months. He began to understand that his personal narrative could be infused and enriched with fictional elements and with his comic timing. The two stories which make up the thesis are both sad and funny and never sentimental. It's been my pleasure to be his reader. Please welcome Raja Pramish to the podium. All right. Thank you, Max. Um, I'm going to read the first half of my story called Oldest Youngest. Grandma said that each playing card I set on the table was another slap across the prophet's face. I was shuffling my old deck of Pokemon cards, pretending to not understand her. I figured I'd given him many beatings through middle school when I obsessed over those cards, the shiny print and meaningless numbers, without ever learning to play. It was just another thing that Grandma said. She had similar pronouncements for television, books, birthdays, girls, and anything she could spot out my window where the seven train shuttled over 82nd Street. In fact, she often peered down at some woman with bare shoulders or kids playing music and shook her head in grief at the state of the world. Look, all our neighbors are sinners, she'd say, and she had more to say the less she understood. A head shorter than me in her flower pattern hijab, she was sustained by an infinite supply of amazement and repulsion. I would be too, if I were born under the thatched roof of a village shed on the coast of East Pakistan before the mid-century and found myself in New York. 
I put the cards away. I was back from boarding school for Thanksgiving break. My mom was pretty much gone all day, taking as much overtime as she could get at the USPS. My sister Isa was still in school, the third grade if I remember right. In the afternoon, Grandma sat on a stool in my room while I played Minecraft and talked in breathless spirals about the end of days. When Jibrael blows, blows his trumpet, the earth will sunder and those who rejected Allah will wake in their graves terrified and remorseful. I thought she was good background noise. Her voice never matched the contents of her words. She spoke with a smile, never expecting any questions. I can never bring myself to tell her that I, that I thought everything she believed in was horseshit. It made her happy, though, who she thought I was. Sometimes, la sometimes later, she chastised my mom for my poor Bengali, and then turned and said how lucky uh, she was to have a grandson who was so studious, who got a scholarship from the president to study across the country and listen to everything she had to say. Why can't you be like that? She asked Isa, who hadn't put down her school bag or walked two feet from the door. I don't know, Isa said. She crumbled off her hijab with one hand before retreating to bed with her iPad. Our mom dropped her off without coming in and went back to work. Hey, boy, your sister doesn't know anything, I heard across the hall. Grandma brought over, her st over the stool and prepared to prod her with a rotation of lectures. She couldn't find her own feet if she couldn't smell them, she said with heaves of laughter, nearly tipping over the stool. I couldn't tell if it was another aphorism from the old country or if she, were just, or if she was just amusing herself. In either case, my sister took it personally, sitting up with a groan and budding tears. Isa only responded to things when they upset her. Her emotional state always teetered between indifference and calamity. It's a joke, Isa. Kids your age likes jokes, she said, smiling, and Isa pouted. But did you pray during, during school today? Don't tell me no, there's no excuse. You know the five prayers of each day are the five keys to the door to heaven. When they had the same conversation earlier, likely yesterday, Isa said she hadn't prayed because she didn't know where or when to do it, and no one else did it, but now she was silent. By the time I came over, Grandma was in the kitchen making her chicken nuggets. Don't blame her. Her stomach's moody. Once Isa was placated by food and the flashy colors spewing out of her iPad, Grandma returned to, re returned to rummage through her closet and shook her head at everything. Elsa, Elsa, Elsa. She flipped one shirt after another. What's Elsa? A Disney princess. Grandma held up one with a picture of a blonde woman in a blue dress. Next to the words, find your destiny. Does she look Muslim to you? Isa's eyes searched for an answer. I don't know. Your mother lets you wear such things, and she doesn't tell you that it'll cost all of us in the end. But I like them, Isa said. What else would I wear? If her grandpa saw you wear this, I would be ashamed. Isa wanted to say, I think he got me one of those, but she just focused on chewing. It wasn't fair to bring grandpa up since he passed. Then grandma reached into the bin of toys by Isa's bed and pulled out some Barbie. If you play too much with these, your hands will turn to plastic. And my sister made a confused face. I'm only telling you because you're getting older, Isa. You must be Islamic in all things. How you eat, what you wear. You have to put some thought into it. Because ignorance will never save you. When will you learn? Next to Isis played, Grandma set down a photo album of pictures of our extended family in Bangladesh. There's your fourth cousin, here's your third aunt, your fifth uncle. She went on, reminiscing about indistinct faces Isa had never seen, and behind them dusky farmlands and jungles. They have lots of things to teach you. Your brother's in one of these somewhere, when he was really little, she said, and settled on a picture of a small tan boy next to a goat. Look, everyone's smiling. The sun was scorching us, the fields flooded. There was no AC, no iPad. You see how little you need to be happy. She said and turned the page. What did it matter to my sister that these people were happy with dirt? Look at all the family you have, and they dearly want you to visit. You want to visit, right? Isa said, uh... Every week your aunts call me crying, when will Isa come, when will Isa come? How big is she? Does she know how to read the Quran? Does she behave? She rested her hand on the page. Allah tells us lying is a grave sin, Isa. So what do I tell them? Then Grandma pointed at various aunties and began to explain the intricacies of being faithful, chaste, and modest. Though this came from someone who walked around barefoot and sifted her hands through everybody's business. Isa stared at the empty plate. I knew she wanted out, but what could I do? My tepid interest seemed like all Grandpa, grand, Grandma wanted from me. Even as she said my Pokemon cards had slapped her beloved prophet, she never took them away or turned off the TV or disrupted anything in the domain of my room. She trusted I'd figure it out myself. Isa was different. With little else to do but cook and pray, Isa had, Grandma had made Isa her project, now that she believed our mom had done everything wrong. Day, she called me from my room, always by my last name. You need to guide her, please. I asked her when the next time to pray is, and she just says, I don't know, after everything. She doesn't understand anything about this life or the next. I said she's only nine. 
Well, she has to know something. What do they learn in school in this country? I shrugged. There's a potato in her head, she said, and I didn't know what to make of it. Your mother thinks it's normal. If it's like this now, it'll only be worse later. You'll see. When she gets bold. She, st she stirred something in a pot over the stove. Please go talk to her. I won't let that girl go to hell. I went to Isa's room, which she shared with our mom, and sat on her bed. There was a cardboard dollhouse against a wall which had three neat rooms, with a bed fashioned out of a tissue box and a small mirror. I looked around until I, th until I thought she'd notice I was there. I never knew how to talk to her, given that I'd missed a third of her life while at boarding school. You doing all right? I asked. What? She said, looking at her iPad. Don't worry, I'll be quick. You know how Grandma is. She can be harsh sometimes, but she does so much for us, so can you... Just try a little bit. You can look up the... How come she doesn't do that to you? She said. Already crying. Why doesn't she care what you do? She does. And she... I'm sorry, come on, you don't have to cry. I didn't do anything. She just yells at me all day. She thinks I'm dumb. You're not dumb. It was just very different where she grew up. And well, I don't think she thinks she's yelling. Sure, she said. My words felt silly against her bitter tone. Okay, if you want to know, it's because you're a girl and I'm not. And mom's always busy, so our grandma wants to. I began to say, and saw that it wasn't improving things, so I just said fine and left. I didn't know how helpful it was to explain things she couldn't control or barely understand. And the crying made me feel guilty when I'd done nothing wrong. That's what I kept telling myself. I held on to a vague sense of wanting to help, but I'll be honest, I never thought that, I never thought that much about my sister. I was the oldest and she the youngest. We needed a middle sibling to feel like we had any relation to each other at all. The difference in age occluded everything, and our family didn't help, with the constant comparisons, the lopsided attention. Both grandma and our mom recited stories of me as a kid that were wholly fictitious, though, though I don't doubt that's what they remembered. I'd never complained, helped with every chore, exercised a prodigious, de prodigious degree of linguistic facility at two, and memorized the Holy Quran by eleven. Going by nicknames, I was their heart, their joy, their everything. But to Isa, I was just another adult coming to bother her with an assortment of impositions. And admittedly, when I, when, I leaned, when I leaned over her shoulder and saw what YouTube videos she binged all day, calling Mickey Mouse at 3 a.m., Roblox story time, she seemed like any random kid, having nothing to do with me. I felt a bit ashamed, and my reflex to bury, thought, bury the thought only made it more pronounced. Isa never asked anything from me, not money and certainly not advice, but I wish she did. It'd have given me a clue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Raja. We have two more readers, and then we're going to have a reception. Just a reminder, please grab a green graduation cord, seniors. They are up here for you. Um, so first, I'm, I'm actually going to introduce Helen, because Hel Helen's um, advisor, Waiki, was not able to be here tonight. Waiki sent along these remarks, and Waiki says, Helen was first a, a student in my auto fiction class. I was mesmerized by her crisp prose, her attention to detail, her intellect on the page. In fall, Helen approached me to write a novella for our family on vacation. How apt. She was taking a literature course on novellas. I had taught novella workshop classes. We both love the form, which melds the art of the short story with the space of a succinct novel. Helen's novella, Tell Me What Happened in Copenhagen, great title, follows a Chinese family on a trip through this idyllic city, yet beneath the facade of familial unity and grace, tension brews. The novella is told in five parts, each from the perspective of a different family member. Together, these parts resonate, working as stories do in linked stories, but much more so because what one perspective excludes for good reason, another includes. And through this perfected, refracted lens, we glimpse three generations of family as they navigate and contend with their own history, culture, modernity, identity, and the rapid pace of progress. Helen's work is provocative and brimming with ideas. This fictional family must grapple with a lot, and Helen's ability to inhabit their minds, their hopes, dreams, and anxieties on both the concrete and abstract level is a sure mark of this writer's talent. In our thesis meetings, Helen was continually generative, continually questioning, yet her faith in the novella form never wavered, and her nimble, multifaceted storytelling only grew in strength. With great pride in her completed work and having seen such an immense project through, I present Helen reading from Tell Me What Happened in Copenhagen. Thank 
Thank you, Waiki, even though you're not here for advising me on this thesis. And thank you to Professor Esty for inspiring the form and my classmates and my friends for listening to me read today. So I'm going to read an excerpt from um, the perspective of the youngest daughter, Leah. The entrance is a small white insertion among shrubbery and trees. Once they enter, the atrium expands upwards into a glass cube with windows as its ceiling, allowing cascades of sunshine to rain upon its visitors. After getting their tickets, Dad and Popo look at Leah expectantly to be their leader. Gazing left, she sees a narrow dark hallway with art lined against the walls. On their right is a brighter open hallway with glass walls which allows them to peek into the colorful outdoor garden. She leads them to the right. The dreamy sunny hallway brings them into an open space filled with sculptures and moving art. Leah approaches the first installation that catches her attention. Metal shapes dangling in the air, rotating on an axis. The shapes part to reveal a projection on the wall, a pink, soft, fleshy, wet thing moving. She feels Popo walk up and stand next to her, pressing into her side. She realizes the projection is a close-up of a moving vulva, which makes her tense. What will Popo think? This is quite beautiful. I've always thought a woman's parts are very elegant. It looks like a mutan flower, the national flower of China, says Popo. I didn't notice that. That's very beautiful, Popo. I think the organic shape contrasts the geometric clarity of the dangling shapes nicely. Mystery and clarity. Her dad walks up alongside them. He squints to look at the piece. Leah, what is this? You've brought us to a museum of pornography. He shakes his head in disdain. He will never be able to understand modern art. Leah thinks he will never be able to understand a part of her. The way she sees art, thinks about things, analyzes the world. Ashamed, Leah takes Popo's arm and leads him in front of another work, a foreboding sculpture representing a large spider with cagey legs. The legs are outstretched, menacing, yet protective, as if insulating something from within, from within it from the dangers outside. Popo gasps in awe. Her pupils darken in surprise. Her mouth turns into an O. What do you see, Popo? It's a mother, spi it's a mother spider. You see its legs? It looks like the way a mother would put her arms to cover her child. If not a mother, then maybe an older sister. Leah wonders how the spider could be an older sister. Ellie, who is only two years older than her, has never protected her from anything. Rather, they've always interacted like they're the same age, sharing the same clothes, same teachers, and same activities. It was only the last two years that they diverged in their paths, with Ellie taking a banking job in London. She lives a new life now, a new life she doesn't share with anyone, not even Leah. Popo, you had a sister, right? Mom has only mentioned Popo's older sister in passing, a washed-out face of a woman standing next to Popo in old black and white photos. Yes. Are you close to her? Popo pauses for a second and tells her. She passed in 2005. She lived in Taiwan with her family. We don't really know her family well. It's been a while since we kept in touch. After strolling around the area for a little, they head to the outdoor cafe, which is situated on a terrace facing the beautiful light blue sea. Leah has always noticed the different qualities of the bodies of water she's visited. Some are tumultuous and angry, seemingly assaulting sand and rock with such worldly force. Others feel mute and lifeless, its calm waters a facade for the forces that lie beneath it. This sea, albeit calm, feels very much alive, glistening and tantalizing, as if beckoning the viewer to break the pristine surface tension of the water. The occasional light gusts of wind send delicate ripples across the surface. A waitress comes to take their orders. Dad's, Dad gets a sandwich, Popo gets a soup with bread, Leah gets a cup of tea. Her dad is halfway through his sandwich before he is interrupted by a call. He takes it and walks to the very far end, of the far end of the terrace, away from the diners. He starts speaking on the phone rather loudly. Other museum visitors, mostly Danes, stare politely in his direction. Popo, can you tell me more about your sister? We didn't finish the conversation earlier. What do you want to know about her? There isn't a lot to say. How come you didn't really keep in touch? When was the last time you actually saw or talked to her? Popo pauses to finish her soup. I thought I would never see her again after her marriage, but by chance I saw her many years after that, before she moved to Taiwan. 
I went to the local Hongkou District Hospital to get some of my medications. After my appointment, I took the elevator down. She was in the elevator. Her beautiful black hair was no longer black, but, sp but sparsely intercepted by small slivers of silver. She made eye contact with me, but we were too afraid to look at each other. It seemed like it was her floor, but she didn't get off. She stayed inside, and we let it fill with people. Then I reached out my hand, and she took it. We held hands for some 20 seconds, maybe even less, before the elevator emptied and it was my turn to get out. Bobo's eyes are shiny and glassy, tears struggling to break the surface tension. She excuses herself to the bathroom. 10, 15, 20 minutes pass by, and Popo has not returned yet. Leah decides to check on her. She goes knocking stall by stall, calling out, Popo, are you in there? The Danish are a quiet bunch. Not many people answer, the ones who do reply in a low-voiced murmur. 10, 15, 20 minutes pass by. Her palms grow clammy. She finds a map and examines the other possible restrooms. The museum is an asymmetrical square composed of four long corridors with galleries dotted, dotted along the hallways. She sighs from relief. This would be a much harder task if the museum was a multi-leveled palatial space like the Met. Upon leaving the cafe, she gets the option of right or left again. Right is the glass hallway that seems to lead into a greenhouse-like structure at the end, while the left is a comforting wooden walkway similar to one you would find in a Chinese home. She goes left and finds herself in a gallery filled with human-like sculptures. These sculptures depict slender figures with long heads resting on short spindly necks, expressions mute with secrets and confidentiality. Despite her intrigue, she continues on. The next hallway is a bright corridor that reflects the light, seemingly inviting the viewer into a window in heaven. At the end of the hallway is a dark spectacle of moving people, shuffling about as if fighting for a spot to look at something. Drawn by curiosity, she walks briskly towards the conglomerated shape of moving masses. Using her small frame, she squeezes through the crevices of the crowd to the front. It's an elevator. A voice protrudes from the crowd. Reactivated. Someone press the button. Having pushed to the front of the crowd, she looks behind at the expectant eyes. Murmurs circulate about how captivating the piece is. More voices urge her on. She taps the button and the elevator opens. A small woman is sitting on the floor curled up in the center. Small thin black strands of hair interlaced with a ma mass of silvery hair. It's Popo. Leah runs into the elevator and crouches beside her. She reaches her hand out repeating, Popo, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. She can't read Popo's expression. Her face is concealed between her arms and knees. The crowd gasps at the scene. Leah feels herself filling with rage, an insatiable storm that consumes all of her, twists her innards into knots. She wants to break all the crappy art in the museum, smash a hole into the glass walls. She yells at the crowd to leave. It's not an art piece. It's not an art piece. It's my grandma. It's my grandma. It's my Popo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Okay, we have one more reader. Chuchi is going to be introduced by J.J. Johnson. Since the form itself can't be manipulated to suit the writing, the writing adapts to suit the form, Chuchi writes. This gets tricky when form is the self, or a self. It's one thing to explore form as something external to the self, as something that attempts to make claims on or for us, as in a non-disclosure agreement or, or petition for an alien relative. One of Chuchi's moves is to fill these official forms to the brim to see what they're doing and what she can make them do. But when we have been internalized by a form like a pronoun contained by a grammar, as we become parts of speech, that formal interrogation becomes an intrapersonal matter. We are among ourselves. So argues Chuchi in her poetics form fitting as she guides us through a series of relations between the writing self and the apparatus of composition. 
What makes this not just a thesis or a collection of poetic interventions is the running commentary the text performs. Each piece is followed by critical reflection that sees itself seeing itself, extending the writer's technique and further drawing the reader in with a sense of the stakes for such engagement, a poetics. To write about one's own writing is risky business, but only if we see it as something external to the writing project. In form fitting, Chuchi shows us what the intrapersonal has to say for themselves. Chuchi. Thank you, JJ, for being such a fantastic advisor, and also thank you to all of you for being here. So I'm going to read three pieces from my work today. The first is called XOXOXX. He says, I should know how to vacuum because I'm a woman, because I'm defined by twin chromosomes, white lace and silk skin, the minute hand ticking by my reflection, mauve and red and champagne bubbles on my eyes, my neck, my collarbone, beneath skin and muscle, I am spooling gold thread and violent shivers to be shaped at the whim of a breath of half a heartbeat, systolic pressure, the blood runs between pores in cotton pulp and filters, a mess of ivory and gold. So the second is when the form actually begins to take a bit more of a defined shape, um, where it actually serves more as a guideline or a template. Um, so this was actually inspired by Tommy Pico's IRL, where text messages, you see text messages in the work itself. So this is called iMessage. Glow-in-the-dark wombats. He tells me it's not glow-in-the-dark, though. That's phosphorescence. Fluorescence, phosphorescence, same thing. At the end of the day, no one knows why they glow. Are you drunk? No, it's Wednesday night. She doesn't know I'm typing a reply while accepting a plastic cup from a pretty stranger. Miss sends texts until I lost you becomes I love you. A cork explodes out of the bottle, oak bullet that lands somewhere beneath my fake plant, and I only have fake plants because I know they won't die on me. I fucked up. I'm really sorry. Can we please talk? No response because I know he's bad at communicating, and he says he's bad at communicating, but at least we agree on that. I dream for the first time in months, or maybe not months, maybe my memory's just going. Maybe it's early onset, but that doesn't usually happen until the 40s or 50s, but who knows? Dreamscape full of people I know, sitting around a slab of metal, and it tasted like a mouthful of battery acid, and faces dissolved into white noise, into cacophony. Just me and black steel, and a rock on my finger I can't remember accepting, and every atom in my body is pulling me away from that damned altar. What's that? A whale tail. It doesn't really mean anything. Liar, I want to say, but my mouth stays sewn shut by threads of tension and the fact that he knows he's lying, and I know he's lying because I remember his story about a 52 hertz whale. Maybe you're just so forgettable. He says he's just joking, just kidding. He's sorry, but he says that every time. Just joking with fantasy impromptu in C sharp minor. Did you know beryllium is super toxic? Yeah, everything on the damn periodic table is toxic. <laughs> and for the final piece, this is definitely one of the more rigid forms, um, the NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, and this is actually part one of it. So non-disclosure agreement. This agreement is entered into on this day between myself and you, wherever you may be reading this document. One, definition of confidential information. For purposes of this agreement, confidential information means any data or information that is proprietary to the disclosing party and not generally known to the public, whether in tangible or intangible form, in, one, in whatever medium provided, whether unmodified or modified by the receiving party, whenever and however disclosed. The pinch of espresso powder I add to my chocolate chip cookie dough is not confidential the dark shade of red somewhere in between crimson and maroon that I consider my favorite color is not confidential, nor is the fact that I own multiple lipsticks in that color when I, all I really need is one. The day on which I was born is not confidential. It was a Tuesday. 
my dislike of chocolate desserts is not confidential, though it might be considered contradictory. Dot, dot, dot is confidential. Two, use of confidential information. The receiving party agrees to use the confidential information solely in connection with the current or contemplated relationship between the parties and not for any purpose other than as authorized by this agreement without the prior written consent of an authorized representative of the disclosing party. Break the terms at your own risk, at the risk of a legal penalty of losing a partnership, of building a finer sieve, keeping even small things from slipping through, of financial loss, of weekly coffee walks, becoming monthly coffee walks, becoming bi-monthly texts, becoming occasionally seeing your name pop up as a social media post notification, of being blacklisted, of always being too busy to get lunch, of sorry, something came up at work, can we take a rain check? of comfortable touches becoming self-enforced social distancing, of familiar features you knew better than your own shadow twisting into a mask, at the risk of becoming a stranger. Three, term. This agreement shall remain in effect until terminated. In witness whereof, the parties hereto have executed this agreement as of the date indicated above. Sign below. Thank you. I want to say thank you to the Kelly Writers House for being our home for the evening. Thank you so much for all of the fabulous thesis advisors. And thank you most of all to the writers who endeavored on these incredible projects all semester long. Thank you for sharing your work. Can we please have one more round of applause for all our readers? <laughs>